Hi, I'm Dr. Green. Welcome to MedTwice. Today we thought we'd try a new type of video. You know, on the comment section of the videos that we've produced, a lot of people have been putting in some questions, and there's some really good questions. And I figure that if somebody takes the time to put a question in, there's probably a whole bunch of people out there that have the same question that maybe uh, weren't able to put the question into the discussion. And so to answer some of these questions, I hope will help to a general audience. Now, we're not sure, quite honestly, whether this is going to go over well or not. And so if you like this content, then it's really important for you to like the video because then we'll know that this is something that we should do in the future. Plus, if you have questions, this is a great place to put your questions down in the discussion section. Uh, if you put the questions in and we get a good response, we'll be doing these uh, periodically and maybe I'll be able to answer your question on the next video. So hit the like button if this is good content for you and make sure you ask your questions. So let's go to some of these questions. We have a question here. It says, I'm confused. The doctor said I'm three centimeters and my cervix is still thick, what does this mean? Am I officially three centimeters dilated or am I zero centimeters? This is a really good question because these numbers and concepts can be confusing for people. When we talk about the, how the cervix is responding to pregnancy and whether pregnancy is progressing, whether labor is progressing or people are starting to go into labor, we really talk about three separate issues with the cervix. We talk about whether the cervix is dilated, which we often call dilatation or dilation. We talk about effacement, which really is how thick the cervix is. And then there's something called station, which has to do with how far down the head of the baby is coming into the birth canal. The way to think about this is think about the cervix in three dimensions. Think of the cervix as a donut. The donut has an opening, and in the cervix case, that opening gets bigger and bigger. The donut also has thickness, and that's what we call effacement. Effacement is how thick that cervix is. And then station is a different measurement completely. It really has to do with where the baby's head is coming down. Usually, if a patient is in her first pregnancy, it's her first baby, the cervix will thin, that's effacement, first, and then it will start to dilate. Uh, that's the number that's measured in centimeters. So effacement generally is measured in percentage. 0% is a completely thick cervix, whereas 100% is a completely thin cervix. Now, in women that have children before, often the cervix will dilate before it will efface. So in this case, we have a patient who was told that her cervix was still thick, which means that the effacement hadn't really started yet, but the opening was already three centimeters. So this is a patient that's probably had children before. And so the cervix is starting to open before it effaces. So she really is three centimeters dilated, but labor may still be a ways away. In other cases, for instance, if you were three centimeters dilated, but you were 90% effaced, a very thin cervix, that's someone who's actually pretty close or actually in labor where the cervix is opening up. So that's where these numbers can be confusing. So yes, you are three centimeters, but because the cervix hasn't really effaced yet, it's still thick, labor may be still a ways away from you. So I hope that answers that question. Let's go on to the next question. This is an interesting situation. This is a patient that hasn't had periods in a long time. She had a pretty thorough workup from her physician and was told that she had a microadenoma. Because of this, her doctor told her that it'd be impossible for her to get pregnant. The, ba the patient wants a baby and she wants to know whether she should try fertility treatment. What do I think about this? If the patient has a microadenoma and it's making her period stop, she probably has something called a prolactinoma. So let me, these are some big words. Let me explain this. Microadenoma is really a, 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 an area in the brain that's generally secreting hormones, and in this case, probably prolactin. Prolactin is a hormone that is made when you're breastfeeding, and it helps the breast to continue to make milk. So when the baby suckles, prolactin goes up, and that tells the breast to make more milk. There's a mechanism in which that the body is smart enough to realize that when the body is breastfeeding and the baby's actively suckling, maybe it's not a good idea to get pregnant. And so prolactin can stop the ovaries um, from making eggs and really can stop the hormone flow to the ovaries and the uterus and keep people from having periods and cause infertility. So in this case, her, she has a microadenoma. She has a little area in the brain that's making too much prolactin inappropriately. She's not breastfeeding, but the brain thinks she is, and it's making prolactin, and that's keeping her from having periods and subsequently keeping her from getting pregnant. I would never say that it's impossible for someone to get pregnant because I've seen people get pregnant after doctors have said that. It's very embarrassing, so I'd never actually say that. 
In this case, however, usually there's medication, bromocryptine is one of them, that can get the prolactin levels back to where they should be. And in that case, it usually works pretty well to get people back to normal function, to where they're having periods, they're making eggs, and then they can't get pregnant. So yes, if you want to have a baby, go see a fertility doctor. It's maybe very simple with just a daily medication uh, that's actually a fairly cheap and, and well-tolerated medicine, and oftentimes that's enough um, to help you get pregnant. So let's look at the next question. This is a, a, another good question. I had a BTL in 2017. Her period is now delayed two months. She wants to know, can I get pregnant after a BTL? So a BTL stands for bilateral tubal ligation. It's getting your tubes tied. It's a sterilization procedure. So this lady had a tubal ligation a couple of years ago, um, and now her periods are delayed. She wants to know if she can get pregnant. Well, the short answer is, yes, it's possible to get pregnant after a tubal ligation, but the chances are very small. The lifetime risk of pregnancy after a tubal ligation is 1%, which is, you know, pretty small, but not insignificant. So one out of 100 women that have their tube types someday will get pregnant. If your period is delayed, especially if you're feeling pregnancy symptoms, maybe you should go get a home pregnancy test. They're very inexpensive and very accurate. You can get them at the dollar store in most situations. And those tests are the exact same tests they have at the doctor's office. If that's negative, then you can feel comfortable that you're not pregnant. If it's positive, obviously, uh, it's time to go see the doctor. One thing I want to talk about with that risk of 1%, when you compare it to other birth control methods, it's a little tricky because the tubal ligation, for some reason, we measure that as lifetime risk. So when you have a 1% chance of getting pregnant after tubal ligation, that's over your entire lifetime. When we talk about risks of failure of birth control, other birth control methods, they're usually talked about in women years. In other words, what you risk per year rather than per lifetime. So all that 1% sounds higher compared to some of the other birth control methods. It's actually pretty low because it's a lifetime risk. So our next question, it says, what do you think about being 37 weeks pregnant and she's being told that her baby is eight pounds? Is it okay to start induction naturally? She says she's not diabetic and she's had a healthy pregnancy. This is a common problem is that people get an ultrasound um, towards the end of pregnancy and the ultrasound starts predicting that the baby may be big. Here's the problem. Ultrasounds are really inaccurate when it comes to baby weight. Uh, they can be off by a good 15%. I've seen ultrasounds off by several pounds towards the end of pregnancy. If you think about it logically, what they're measuring is an ultrasound basically is the hat size, the head circumference. Uh, they make actually two head measurements, but if you think about the hat size, they're measuring the abdominal circumference or the belt size, and then they're measuring the femur length, basically the inseam. So imagine if I gave you my hat size, my belt size, and my inseam, are you going to be able to predict my weight? Pretty difficult. Uh, and, but that's what they're doing in ultrasound. And so these weights are, are not that accurate. In fact, they did a really interesting study where they had women at term that were full-term pregnancy. They'd had babies before. They did an ultrasound to guess the weight. They had the doctor examine the tummy, and the doctor took a guess at the weight. And then they asked the woman what she thought the baby weighed. When they delivered the baby, it turned out that the, the woman was closest, the doctor was second, the ultrasound was last. So my advice is I would not change management based on an ultrasound weight. Uh, certainly I wouldn't induce pregnancy at 37 weeks because the baby may not ready to be come out yet. Uh, and I certainly, with a supposed eight pound baby, wouldn't recommend a C-section for that either. Hang tight. Uh, the baby weight is a really a big guess. Uh, and chances are you'll go into labor on your own and have a nice normal vaginal delivery. So that would be my advice uh, in this situation. Let's take a look at another question. Uh, is 17 weeks an accurate time for a gender reveal? You know, at 17 weeks is a great time to see whether it's a boy or a girl on ultrasound. It's actually kind of the prime time. Somewhere between 17, 20, 21 weeks is the best time to really see gender on ultrasound. And the reason is that the parts are there and, um, and they're big enough to see, but the baby isn't so big yet that it sort of folds over itself and hides things. So yes, 17 weeks is a great time to look to see uh, what the gender of the baby is. Let's take a look at another question. I'm 36 three days and feeling pain and contractions. Is this normal? 
Maybe it's normal, maybe it's not. It depends on how much pain and how many contractions. It is very normal to feel pain at 36 weeks. Uh, I generally talk about the 32-week wall. Uh, once people hit 32 weeks, pregnancy is kind of not fun anymore. It just gets really uncomfortable. And the bigger you get and the farther along you get, the more uncomfortable things are. So it is very normal to have pain and discomfort at 36 weeks. It's also normal to have some contractions. Uh, contractions that are coming irregularly and now and then are completely normal. We often call them Braxton Hicks contractions, but it's also a little early for you to have the baby. So if you're having strong regular contractions that aren't going away with rest or increased fluids, you might want to go uh, call your doctor or go to the hospital to be checked to make sure you're not yet in labor. Generally, you know, contractions every seven minutes or more uh, at 36 weeks that aren't going away in spite of fluids and laying down really ought to be checked out. Uh, definitely worth a call to your doctor. So that's the questions uh, that we have uh, for this segment. Again, uh, this is a new format that we're trying out. If you like this format, please hit the like button. That's how we'll know that this is something that you want to see more of. Uh, and if you have questions, please ask them in the discussion section. And uh, if we do more of these videos, um, who knows, uh, maybe I'll be able to answer your question in the next one. Thank you. Mm -hmm.